So Sundays, how we start? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, uh, so it's a privilege to introduce Stacy Finley uh, from the University of Southern California, where she is the director for the Center for Computational Model of Cancer and associate professor at the Biomedical Engineering and Chemical Engineering Department. Uh, so Stanley has a very distinguished um, CV already. She has a bachelor's in chemical engineering from the University of Agriculture and Mining here at Florida. So, so uh, are you actually from Florida, Stacy? No, I'm not, no. no you just spent some years here. Just and spent some time. Did, did your PhD at Northwestern University in chemical engineering as well. Uh, postdoc at Johns Hopkins and then joined uh, USC as assistant professor in 2013. She is a, well, she's got quite a few honors, including uh, the American Association for Cancer Research Next, Next Gen Star. She's got an NSF uh, career award. So lots of accolades and lots of great, great, great research. And uh, we're hoping to listen to one of those pieces today. I know that you're coming back in December to, to give another talk as a ground rounds, but we are really happy to have you here today, Stacey, please. Thanks so much for the introduction, David, and thank you for the invitation. I'm excited to um, give a seminar to present some of the recent work that we've done in modeling signaling pathways inside of natural killer cells. And as David mentioned, yes, I'm coming back, coming back um, in December for Grand Rounds, but this is a, a new story, relatively new. And so I'm excited to talk to you about this today. And you'll hear something completely different uh, uh, if you were to come to the Grand Rounds talk in December. So as we know, um, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with mathematical oncology, uh, really cancer is uh, well suited for a computational approach since it does involve a range of processes such as angiogenesis and immune cell activation. It involves a range of cell types, including tumor cells, stromal cells and immune cells and many other types of cells. And also it involves events that happen across different time scales and link scales. And so in my lab, we're really applying mathematical modeling to predict the dynamics of biochemical reaction networks in cancer. And we're doing this with the goal of trying to help develop new drug treatments and also better understand the effects of existing uh, treatment strategies. And so to accomplish this, we apply systems biology tools. And so this means studying the whole system rather than individual parts separately. And we uh, use mathematical modeling along with a, com a combination of different experimental studies. Really, we're collaborating with a number of different experimental research groups to get the data that we need for model building and then go back and test the models uh, predictions experimentally as well. So we're applying modeling to study complex networks inside of cells in three different applications. The first is immune cell signaling. So really trying to understand how immune cells become activated. A lot of our work here has been in CAR T cells and that's gonna be the, the focus of my talk uh, in December. But today we're talking about another type of immune cell which is uh, natural killer cells. Another application of our modeling work is in tumor angiogenesis. So the formation of new blood vessels and how the tumor really co-ops this very normal process for its own benefit. And we've studied different ways in which uh, angiogenic factors interact with their receptors in order to promote uh, the signaling that leads to uh, proliferation of endothelial cells, sprouting and migration and so on. And then we're also interested in cancer metabolism. And this is uh, a grant that we have from NIH, a U01 through the Cancer Systems Biology Consortium where we're looking at um, trying to understand the dynamics of central carbon metabolism in colorectal cancer cells, along with uh, cancer associated fibroblasts. And this is an exciting uh, collaboration that I have with Shannon Mumenthaler's lab here at USC, as well as Paul Macklin, who I'm sure you all are very knowledgeable of as well at Indiana University. Um, but today what I'll be talking about is our work in immune cell signaling and specifically focusing on um, one particular type of immune cell, the natural killer cell. So natural killer cells can eliminate cancer cells by uh, targeting and upon cell contact. They express a repertoire of receptors, stimulatory receptors, for example, that bind to their continent ligand on the target cell. And that initiates a signaling cascade of different phosphorylation reactions. And this ultimately leads to NK cells becoming activated and secreting these cytolytic uh, factors that can lyse and kill the cancer cells. 
And so this innate ability of cancer cell elimination by natural killer cells has really spurred an interest in um, trying to better understand natural killer cell activation. For example, in vitro studies suggest a strong correlation between the activation of the natural killer cell and various uh, uh, signaling species in order to allow the cell to target and kill uh, some foreign cell, such as a tumor cell. Um, but we know that these signaling pathways are complex. So even though cancer cell killing is initiated by a cascade of these different signaling re uh, reactions that are mediated by natural killer cell receptors, it's important to understand how this signaling propagates and leads to the activation of downstream species with the goal of activating the natural killer cell overall. But there is some natural complexity and nonlinearity that really underlies this intracellular signaling. And so it's difficult to understand how the signaling could be modulated to enhance a signaling species. And this complexity is really a nice context in which to apply mathematical modeling, since we know that models are allowing us to unravel these uh, different complicated system behaviors and also be able to predict the system level response to a wide variety of perturbations. And so while there are previous models of natural killer cell signaling, there still are some unanswered questions about these cells. For example, which uh, strategies would we implement in order to enhance cell signaling and why remains an open question. Um, additionally, existing models do not really focus in on the mo uh, molecular perturbations uh, or which pathways should be co-stimulated in order to optimally activate the natural killer cell network. And so for this reason, we've developed a, a molecularly detailed, experimentally validated mechanistic model of natural killer cell signaling to address those questions. And we're specifically focusing in on three three stimulatory receptors, CD16, NKG2D, and 2B4, because these pathways are known to contribute to cell lysis in different ways. And so this is really the work of a very talented graduate student in my lab, Sahak Makarian. Um, we published part of this, and that's the first half of my talk that I'll describe um, earlier this year in integrative biology. And we have currently um, on BioArchive another uh, body of work, and it's under review right now as well. So ligand binding to these three receptors, NKG2D, CD16, and 2B4, initiates a cascade of intracellular signaling reactions. And this occurs um, through the PI3 kinase activation network, uh, PLC gamma, as well as SLP76. So that's um, part of ERK pathway as well. We know that ERK is correlated with cell proliferation, PI3 kinase and AKT are correlated with cell survival and uh, PLC gamma activation induces the release of uh, intracellular calcium ions, which also contribute to cell activation and correlate with the production of various cytokines that are needed to mediate target cell killing. So we looked at this uh, pathway here and most of the downstream reactions are common between the three different receptors, uh, but there are some differences. For example, 2B4 does not induce AKT phosphorylation, um, and 2B4 and uh, NKG2D lead to the phosphorylation of SLP76 at two specific sites, while CD16 leads to the phosphorylation of both of those sites leading to doubly phosphorylated SLP76. So clearly these pathways are interconnected and understanding the dynamics of the concentrations of the molecular species in the pathway really requires a quantitative and in-depth analysis. And so we're using this model to predict the dynamics of the natural killer cell signaling network. So I'm gonna to talk to you about two different applications of the modeling. Uh, one is to predict the activation that's induced by these receptors, really focusing in on this very detailed mechanistic model. And that will be the first half of the talk. And then secondly, um, looking at how to apply this model to maximize the secretion of cytolytic molecules. And that combines the mechanistic model with uh, optimal control theory. So we constructed a model to predict the concentrations of the molecular species in the CD16, 2B4, and NKG2D pathways in natural killer cells. Um, the rates of the biochemical signaling reactions are represented using Michaelis-Minton kinetics. And we use this rule-based modeling framework called BioNetGen, 
um, in order to give the set of ordinary differential equations that describe how the concentrations of the species evolve over time. So BioNetGen allows us to automatically generate this reaction network by specifying biochemical rules about which species interact with one another. And then it gives us the set of differential equations. And in total, the model consists of 36 species and 83 parameters. And so we estimated the parameter values by fitting the model to experimental data. And the data are from published in vitro experiments where primary natural killer cells are stimulated by antibodies. And then immunoblotting is used to quantify the level of the intracellular signaling species. So to fit the data, we applied a Bayesian uh, parameter estimation approach which takes some prior information for the model parameters and tries to estimate what the posterior distribution of the parameter value should be given some experimental data. And we applied the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Um, this fitting approach uh, is really well detailed in our, our paper in integrative biology. So I'm not gonna really um, present the, re the, the details here, but of course I'm happy to talk more if you do have questions. So here I show just a subset of the data that we use for fitting. You can see that we're comparing the normalized amounts of different phosphorylated species where the lines indicate the model predictions and the points here uh, indicate the experimental time courses. So the blue refers to the signaling that occurs when the CD16 receptor is stimulated. Uh, yellow indicates signaling for uh, NKG2D receptor stimulation and then purple indicates uh, signaling for the 2B4 uh, receptor. So overall, the model is really nicely able to capture the experimental data pretty well. And we also um, simulated some experimental uh, conditions that we didn't use for uh, model fitting. And so in these, uh, these data, which we use for validating the model predictions is where 2B4 and um, NKG2D are stimulated simultaneously. So it's co-stimulation and we can see the measurements for phosphorylated ERK and phosphorylated PLC gamma. And again, the model is able to reproduce these data that weren't used for model fitting. So then we applied this calibrated model in order to make some novel predictions about the dynamics of the signaling network. So we first applied the model to predict the magnitude of activation of various downstream signaling uh, uh, species that I mentioned previously have been uh, correlated to different characteristics of natural killer cell activation. And so we simulated the time courses of some of these downstream signaling species and then took the area under the curve as a way to characterize overall activation of that species after we simulated the model for 60 minutes. And so here I'm just showing the amount of activation of phosphorylated SLP76 and just to note where it lies in the network. Again, this is influencing ERK activation, which uh, correlates to cell proliferation. So just a note, uh, I didn't mention so much about the model fitting, but what we do is to run the Bayesian parameter estimation approach 200 independent times with different starting guesses. And um, then we simulate each for the each 200 runs, we simulate out to 10,000 iterations of this Metropolis Hastings algorithm. And we take the last 1,000 iterations. So that's why these error bars for the model predictions are present, just indicating the standard deviation of those 1,000 parameter sets. So overall, what I'll show you is that each pathway, CD16, 2B4, and NKG2D, they activate the network differently. For example, um, for the activation of PLC, or sorry, SLP76, when stimulating the CD16 receptor, it produces the maximal response compared to the other receptors. And that's in comparison, for example, to stimulating NKG2D where it provides the maximal response for phosphorylated BAV and also phosphorylated PLC gamma. On the other hand, there's no statistical difference between the activation of these pathways, for example, for uh, uh, ERK or AKT. And so these results really support our systems level evaluation of the network because focusing on just a single uh, species does not fully represent the effects of stimulating the NK receptors as a whole. I have a quick question, Stacy, before you sure. go on. So um, 
just, you know, in, some, in sense, a little kind of philosophical discussion about why this sort of modeling approach. And as you're saying, you know, the systems level is kind of given as some important information as opposed to sort of carving out one specific pathway. Yeah. But, but the systems level also has to make assumptions about how those pathways interact. Right. And so, you know, based on your schematic there, I see some um, interactions that are sort of looking at, you know, one way flow uh, and some have two, like both backwards and forwards. Yeah. Um, how do you know what the relative rates of those are? Sure. Um, right, because it must be hard to detangle when there's a feedback like that. Right, so um, we're fitting those approximately 80 parameters to the experimental data. I didn't show all the data. So we do have a good uh, number of data points, but still you're right, the system is underdetermined meaning that we don't have as many data points as we have parameters that we're fitting. So we're, you're, we have to make some assumptions about um, which, for example, which parameters to um, fit here. So we're saying that maybe we don't fit the um, reverse rate. We just, for if we know that, for example, this is a reversible reaction, we know maybe that it follows some, it has some uh, KD value for the affinity. So based on some literature evidence about biomolecular reactions and two species coming together to form a complex, we know that the um, on rate, the association rate is pretty tightly uh, constrained. So that information goes into the Bayesian parameter estimation. We have at least a little bit of prior knowledge about how to constrain these parameter values. But you're certainly right, assumptions made at the level of constructing the model network itself influence our ability to match experimental data. Um, yeah. We did a lot of fitting. We partitioned the data into training and validation sets and we did that multiple times just to make sure that we weren't introducing any bias into our fitting by saying we had to fit to these training sets and then validate with a separate set. Um, so we tried to at least um, mitigate some of that bias that could be incorporated, but absolutely we're subject to the uh, assumptions that we make. Sure, and there's nothing wrong with that. We all make those sorts of um, assumptions, but I think it's good that what you're saying is you're not just fitting, you're also sort of constraining with some biology that might absolutely. be known about those processes, right? So, um, you know, I've seen these sorts of networks of, um, considered using sort of Boolean approaches, using other, you know, other assumptions, right? So just the, the pure, just the fact that there is an interaction, never mind what its rate is, mm. right? Okay. And so, um, and they can get certain results out of that. But here you're explicitly looking at a temporal, in, you know, reaction. And so that level of complexity in some sense has to be justified. And so I guess, you know, a follow-up question uh, is why do you think you need that temporal dynamic here? What does it give you? Yeah, so um, we have experimental data that I showed over time. Um, so I think that's helpful instead of just taking one snapshot. Although, of course, that's what the model, um, one adv advantage of the model is as well is that we can predict what the um, time courses would be. But I think at least to constrain the model and to have something that allows us to make these predictions and to rely and make sure that the model is reliable, then we have to have some, ideally we would have some uh, time course data to also further constrain the parameter values rather than just a full change uh, for a single time point for one of the parameters uh, for one of the species. So of course with modeling, and uh, I would say the more data, the better, um, but at least the type of data that is really useful is the time course measurements. Great, thanks. Okay, um, so that was for individual species. We also defined this network activation to try to provide an overall metric of uh, the signaling through the network. And we um, define this as being the sum of the area under the curves for each of these five species. So taking the norm of the five signaling species here, ERK, phosphorylated ERK, phosphorylated AKT, uh, phosphorylated PLC gamma, VAV, and SLP76. And so this gives us a way to compare overall the effects of uh, stimulating the different receptors. And so, the results show that 
stimulation of CD16 actually provides the greatest extent of uh, or magnitude of network activation compared to 2B4 um, or NKG2D um, at equal ligand concentration. So that's another note to make here is that we stimulated these receptors with the same concentration of their cognate ligands. So I do note, and this is another assumption, um, that we assume each of these outputs contributes equally to the network activation. We do not consider a weighted sum. Um, this increased detail could be added as more data or experimental observations become available that would support how to weight each of the terms. But together, this slide, along with the, sides, uh, the results from the previous slide, demonstrate that the receptors differentially activate the network. And so this model is needed to help us understand how perturbing the network would then influence not only the overall network activation, but also the activation of individual signaling species. So next, we investigated how changing the ligand concentration used to stimulate each receptor would influence the network activation. And so this can be considered a dose response curve illustrating how changing the input, which is the ligand concentration, influences the predicted output, which is the network activation. So the model predicts that in general, um, the magnitude of the network activation increases as more ligand, uh, as the ligand concentration is increased. And then for all ligand concentrations that we simulated, the model predicts that CD16 and NKG2D provide greater activation or lead to greater activation compared to stimulation of the 2B4 pathway. So it's indicating that 2B4 provides just some lower weak activation of the stimulatory network. Um, but interestingly, for all three pathways, see, we see this um, saturation of the network activation at very high ligand concentrations. And so we try to dig into the model given its mechanistic detail to better understand this observation. And so what we found is that the estimated uh, affinity or the inverse of that, the equilibrium constant between the ligand and the receptor um, that we can calculate from the estimated parameter values, um, that really influences when the network activation becomes saturated. So for uh, CD16, it's right around four micromolar for that, um, that uh, constant for NKG2D, it's about two micromolar, and that's in comparison to 2B4, where it's right around 0.5 micromolar. So it tells us why these um, stimulating these receptors is more sensitive, or this receptor signaling is more sensitive to increased levels of the ligand compared to 2B4. Um, we also saw this little blip here, um, and I'm just highlighting it with a star. Um, because this is sort of an unexpected peak um, at this intermediate value of a ligand concentration, right around 0.3 micromolar. Um, and so we can, again, try to understand why this is happening. And really it's um, determined by the concentration of the receptor itself. So it's happening right around the concentration level of the receptor, which is about 0.35 micromolar. And so we can understand that um, this peak is really due to uh, the, the receptor concentration and that provides the upper bound for the network activation. And just to dig in more here, we did vary 2B4 and say, let's go from 0.03 all the way up to 30 micromolars just to see um, and confirm that that's what happens. And yes, the upper bound of the um, network activation really occurs when the ligand concentration is matching the concentration of the uh, receptor. So it makes sense uh, that you can't uh, add more and more ligand when all the receptors are fully saturated or bound to the, to the ligand themselves. We see a similar result here for NKG2D. Um, and so we try to understand again, why we see this maximum, but not only that, why do we see this decrease? That's not so, it's a little bit apparent here, but definitely not happening for 2B4. And so this uh, decrease with increased ligand concentration really depends strongly on the balance between the rate at which NKG2D is dephosphorylated, so how we can attenuate the signal by the phosphatases compared to the rate of decay of the phosphorylated species. So one thing to note here is that the, phosphate, uh, the phosphorylation events to 
um, activate the receptors actually encourages uh, dephosphorylation or attenuation of the signal due to the phosphatases. And so the more uh, phosphorylated receptors you have that actually proportionally um, is proportional to the rate at which they are degraded or decay over time. And so having faster um, and greater phosphorylation of some of the intermediates also leads to their natural decay as well. So we've incorporated these different mechanisms into the model and we can understand how they are affecting this overall prediction of the network activation. So altogether, we see that the receptor characteristics really do influence network activation and we can exploit the, the model's detail in order to understand these predictions. So overall, the model is predicting that we really want to have this optimal NK receptor that has high concentration, a low uh, KD value, and then faster activation. And that will more potently uh, lead to activation of the intracellular signaling pathways that mediate uh, NK, cell, NK cell activation. So um, another set of simulations that we did is to see, well, what happens now when we stimulate multiple pathways at once? And what happens when we do this for a range of ligand concentrations? So we examined how stimulating two or even three pathways simultaneously would affect the network activation. And we use the concentration at which that network activation is half of the maximal value in order to compare the results across these different co-stimulatory effects. And so this is akin to a half maximal effective concentration or EC50. And we find that co-stimulation of CD16 along with NKG2D, so this is the red bar here, requires about 30% less um, constant, lower concentration of compared to the um, co-stimulation here of NKG2D and 2B4. Um, that's uh, the, sorry, yeah, that's the um, magenta bar and also uh, about 30% lower than stimulating all of the receptors at the same time. And also 50% less concentration for the ligand compared to stimulating CD16 and 2B4. So at first glance, you might just guess that maybe it's will lead to the maximal network activation if we just stimulate all three pathways uh, simultaneously, but that's not what the model is predicting. And so we can start to understand why that happens by again, looking at the structure of the model. And what we know is that activation of the 2B4 pathway can actually increase uh, that negative feedback. So it increases and activates the phosphatase activity um, in addition to activating the downstream kinases and signaling species. So co-stimulation of all three pathways is actually less effective than stimulating just CD16 and NKG2D because of the enhanced uh, activation of the phosphatases. So again, the model is providing us some detailed mechanistic insight that we can use maybe even further down the line to understand how to um, engineer a, a chimeric antigen receptor that would be combine, combining different um, signaling domains from these endogenous receptors. So the last set of simulations for this first uh, application of the model is where we varied different parameter values um, that influence downstream signaling. So we know we have these phosphatases, we can change the activity of the phosphatases, SHP or SHIP, we can change the rate at which SFK actually activates this um, this phosphatase, we can change the affinity between the ligand and the receptor, and then we can also change the rate at which these phosphorylated receptors are degraded. So these are different perturbations that we applied to the network in order to see how do they influence the overall network activation. So we did, we investigated these four different strategies um, for different ligand concentrations. And here I show the results just for CD16, but we also see similar things for 2B4 stimulation and also NKG2D. So very, for very low ligand concentration, changing the decay rate of the phosphorylated receptor is actually most effective in increasing the network activation. So we can increase the network activation um, by about 20% if we have this strong um, increase in the um, 
in um, influencing the phosphorylation of the receptor and the decay of that phosphorylated receptor. Um, but as the ligand concentration changes and increases, a different strategy actually becomes more effective, specifically um, decreasing the activity of the phosphatase SHP is the one um, perturbation that would increase network activation the most. And even for higher ligand concentrations, the network activation, it is less sensitive to these perturbations, but still decreasing the uh, phosphatase activity is shown to be most effective. So overall, the model predictions show that the network activation is tightly controlled by the decay rate of the phosphorylated receptors, as well as the phosphatase activity. But we see that these uh, predictions as to the efficacy of the different strategies is really context dependent. So when the input level is low, so low ligand concentration, it's more important to engineer receptors that are um, resistant to proteolytic cleavage as this enables the activated receptor to continue um, inducing intracellular signaling. Um, and that's in comparison to what happens when there's a high abundance of the ligand, so high ligand concentration. In this case, having cleavage resistant receptors is not as influential since that large um, signaling concentration of the ligand can still allow activation of the network. And so in this case, it's more effective to inhibit the activity of the phosphatase and that allows the signaling species to remain active. So this um, role of the phosphatase is gonna come up in the second half of the talk as well. Um, so I just wanna sort of put that in your mind to think about more as we go to this second half. So maybe I'll just pause here um, to see if there are any questions um, in this first half of the talk, really thinking about how to first build the mathematical model and then use it to understand activation um, at the network level for NK cell signaling. Any questions? Should I have a pause? Sure, I'll, I'll ask a question. I, I was gonna wait, but I was, I, 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 this seems like a good breaking point. So hi, I wanted to just ask, uh, I had a few questions about the, the model fitting. Um, so, I thought I noticed on the slides where that you were showing it and then the validation that it looked like the scale included negative numbers. Yeah. So yeah, let me go back here actually so we can take a look at that. Sure, yeah, sorry. Um, no, no, it's good. So I guess one question was when you did the area under the curve, did you take the absolute value or? Yeah, so this is a good point. So um, the negative values be come because we're normalizing the experimental data and the corresponding model predictions to a particular time point. So the immunoblot measurements are not absolute values. Um, and so we normalize to one time point here, it's 10 minutes. So you can see that mm -hmm. the percent change is right at zero for 10 minutes. And it's a different value. We try to use 10 minutes across all of the experimental uh, time courses, but that's why we have negative values because for example, at 30 minutes, the amount of phosphorylated SFK is below the value at 10 minutes. Okay. So this is just uh, sort of an artifact of um, trying to use the, um, semi-quantitative immunoblot data for model fitting. But certainly when we do the, param the, the model simulations, Everything's all positive. of the concepts are positive and we're taking the area under the curve just as it is. Okay, and as a second question, do you show uh, the fitting? Um, so what was the order? I mean, so these percent differences are large and things get close. So zero is not really zero. So one of the things um, that I know that can happen when you're, when you're plotting something that spikes early and then goes back down and you say, look, it does a good job fitting later yeah. because it's getting back down to a normal or low value. It only looks like it's good because everything low, if you, if you fit something and it's decaying to zero, everything will look like a good fit. It's decaying to zero. So yeah. does it look good on a log scale as well? Mm. That's a good point. Um, we didn't plot this on a log scale, but that's something that we can go back and take a look at. Um, mm -hmm. But you're right, we, um, we may be ignoring some small um, discrepancies that actually could be magnified. Yeah, um, they, they, only, 
I only say it because we have something that we're looking at something similar with CAR T. And when you look on this type of scale, the fit looks perfect. But when you go on a on a log scale, you know, even though the thing is going to zero, yeah. it might be 0 0.01 for the data, but one, to, you know, I'm getting one to the negative six power. Absolutely. So, yeah. So anyway, but thank yeah, you. thanks. That's good to note. Um, to go back and just confirm and see how things are working for this particular fitting. I appreciate that comment. Um, Stacy Tiger, I've got a question for this very slide as well. Then you look in the top right plot, are you any concerned that your fit seems to indicate a three times higher yeah. activation early on than any of the data suggests? Yeah, so this is something that we thought about a lot um, because there are different ways that we could normalize the data. So we selected a time point that is not the maximal value taken ex from the experimental measurement. Uh, that otherwise that would be normalizing to this very short two minute, um, about two minute time point. But that would force, if we normalized here, that would force the model to predict that the maximum of value also occurs here, which we don't necessarily know. So I agree that we're taking a little bit of freedom to say, well, maybe the, um, peak happens at a different time, but also the absolute value of the peak uh, could be something to consider. We did, um, and I didn't show it here, but we had really two, really three clusters of parameter sets from those 200 fits. And what we found is that some of the, two of the clusters, and I'm showing the results, and in the paper we showed the results for just one cluster, two of the clusters of parameter values had a very, very low, um, like absolute quant uh, prediction for the species activation. So we did try to take, in, take this into account and say, well, we know that there has to be some appreciable amount of, for example, SLP 76. It can't be um, 10 to the minus eight concentration uh, micromolar. Um, but you're right that this is a very big increase that the model is predicting. We just, we don't have any additional data to constrain and say that this is right or wrong. So uh, to follow up on that, the things I appreciate that answer that makes perfect sense. So if you were to accept the parameter set that gives you a slightly less good thing, but not a sharp spike early on, would the model conclusions still be the same when you simulate the networks, uh, more, uh, the more complex networks? Yeah, to be honest, I would have to go back um, and look at the parameter estimations, not just for um, the cluster that I'm showing here, but see if there's another cluster that has a lower um, mm -hmm. maximum value, for example, for SLP 76, and does that still lead to the same conclusions? We really move forward with just this particular cluster because at least here, there was some, again, some appreciable amount of each of the species, um, and so that gave us we wanted to make sure that we're not just simulating um, very, very low activation because we know that that would not be able to lead to cell killing. Um, but that's a good point to see if we do see something that's not as high for this uh, initial uh, peak, this early peak, would that lead to the same conclusions? Thank you. So Sahak is listening. <laughs> Maybe he's taking notes too. <laughs> Um, hi, I, I was curious about the extent of the data that we use, was used in the calibration. So is this the, um, all the data that was used for, for calibrating? No, this is not all the data. I'm just showing a subset of the data. Um, we had, so you can see here, um, five data points for this, but we had a total of about 65 data points. So this is really just a subset. And then we had another 20 or so that we used for validation. And um, are, are these the only proteins that um, were, were measured? No, so they also, we also had measurements for AKT and for VAV. Um, so there were, I think, six total proteins that we had measurements for across the three pathways um, over time. And mm -hmm. even for uh, validation, it wasn't just ERK and PLC gamma. Again, I'm just showing a, a, a so smaller subset of those data. Yeah, I, I guess the reason why I'm asking is because I'm, I'm wondering if you feel confident that uh, in the sort of uniqueness of your solutions, right, that the space is sufficiently constrained yeah. by the data. Yeah, 
Yeah, so this also is sort of related to what I was mentioning in response to Heiko's question, which is, um, and even earlier on from Sandy, the model, the system is underdetermined. So we have a number of parameters that we're fitting and not as many data points. So that's sort of a characteristic almost of uh, these kind of systems biology models, um, which is why we are not, um, we can see what the predictions would be for the range of model uh, estimated parameter values. So we're not saying that just a single value is correct. And this is also a nice way to use the Bayesian approach is that we have a distribution of parameter values and we can see what the likelihood is of a particular parameter value across the full uh, range. Thank you. Okay. Hi, hey, Stacy. I had one Hi. other question, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, and it goes back to the parameter fitting. And um, so for the 83 parameters, does the Bayesian approach take into account any types of like uh, correlations? Like, did you do any sensitivity or identifiability analysis to determine which of the parameters to estimate? Yeah, yes. So there's a lot hidden in this, uh, in this single um, slide. We did do parameter identifiability, like uh, pairwise, calculating the pairwise uh, correlation coefficients for different um, pairs of parameters. And we did that before we decided which set of parameters to fit with the model to make sure that we um, weren't trying to fit two very tightly correlated parameters. Um, so we did that first, um, sort of like structural identifiability, and then a subset of those were used for the model uh, fitting. Um, the Bayesian approach, um, I think it does take into account some correlations, but still we needed to do that identifiability step first. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then one other thing, um, with the training and the testing, was it an equal split between the 65 data points or did you use a proportion? Yeah, so this, maybe you were a reviewer for this paper because <laughs> that came up in the review, which is um, like, how did we decide to use this subset of the data for validation versus for training? Um, so we actually, from the beginning, we said, okay, well, let's use the valid as validation, the data for co-stimulation of multiple pathways. Um, and then for fitting, just stimulation of a single pathway. But in doing the revisions, um, we actually tried a number of different combinations of the um, data set. So let's say that this was a single data set. We said, well, maybe we should shift it over to be used for validation, or we can just jumble up, um, have all these different permutations of which sets would be used for fitting and validation. And we found, um, and we did the comparison at the level of seeing what the error is between the model predictions and the experimental data. And we found that still, this is a good way to partition the data, even though we sort of did that a priori, like from the beginning. Um, but even switching up the data, we can see whether it's better to have, like what kinds of data sets would be best for validation versus for parameter fitting. So that was sort of another um, intermediate study that we did as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna go back here. So I have a probably about 15 more slides. So we'll see how we are with time. Um, so yes, yeah, so the second part of the talk is like really building on this mechanistic model and now trying to answer this question about how do we optimize secretion of the cytolytic molecules? So the motivation here is that natural killer cells um, can exhibit this exhaustive phenotype. Um, and it's shown to be correlated with a decrease in receptor density that could be due to degradation of the receptors. Um, another contribution to exhaustion is the deactivation of signaling species that contributes to this lower level of activation, even with increased and repeated stimulation of the natural killer cell receptor. And then lastly, um, having continued stimulation actually depletes the inner stores of cytolytic molecules such, as, such that the natural killer cell is not able to target and kill the uh, cancer cell. So really addressing any of these um, events or limitations individually may not prevent natural killer cell exhaustion. And so we thought that maybe we can use the mathematical model to help us understand perhaps which combinations of mod, um, modifications to the signaling pathways 
would allow us to enhance the, the network and counteract the effects of exhaustion. So um, to do this, we apply the mechanistic model combined with optimal control theory in order to see how can we maximize the cytolytic, um, the secretion of cytolytic molecules. I'm just gonna pause for one second here to take care of crying baby. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Um, so uh, I guess that at this stage is, is probably best if, if we keep the rest of the questions until the very end. So those who have meetings after can just see the rest of the presentation all the way to the end and leave just the questions to, you know, um, later on. Thanks, Stacey. Okay. All right. Yeah. Time is winding down. <laughs> time is winding down. Um, so what we had to do first is to expand the model to account for secretion of the cytolytic molecules. And specifically, we're talking about this um, protein called perfrin-1, as well as granzyme B. So I'm showing the signaling network represented as a graph um, to more clearly show a little bit the uh, interactions between the signaling species, which are the nodes here. Um, the different inputs are um, the ligands for the receptors. So the receptor CD16 binds to of this um, antibody rituximab and MICA is an antigen that binds to and stimulates NKG2D. And then the formation of this complex promotes the downstream signaling activation that we saw before, um, including activation of this kinase that also influences its own um, phosphor dephosphorylation. And we included these outputs where the secretion of these cytolytic molecules is mediated by the signaling species uh, PLC gamma and also VAV. And that's based on uh, experimental literature evidence. So again, we have this set of differential equations that describe how the concentrations of the species evolve over time. And we do again, the Bayesian parameter estimation here, we're fitting only the parameters that have to do with secretion of the cytolytic molecules and how that secretion is mediated by PLC gamma, as well as some interactions between the receptors that uh, come up with prolonged stimulation. So the data that we're using to fit is a little bit different. It's the amount of perforin that's secreted by the cells. Um, for example, after CD16 is stimulated for a longer period of time. So the blue dots here show the experimental measurements. The green dots show the model prediction for CD16 stimulation. But also we have some other data and this is with, um, this goes along with the repeated stimulation here. So we have measurements for the amount of perforin that is secreted when CD16 receptor is stimulated for three successive rounds with a 15 minute washing step in between. So three rounds of 60 minute stimulation with washing in between, or when CD16 is stimulated twice, and then the third round leads actually has stimulation of NKG2D. So we're sort of switching from CD16 stimulation here after the second round to the third round with NKG2D stimulation. We also have data that shows the reverse. So two rounds of stimulation of NKG2D, followed by a third round uh, where CD16 is stimulated, but I'm not showing um, those data uh, right now. And then we can look at the amount of intracellular perforin and also the amount of the CD16 receptor as well. Um, and so again, this is just a subset of the data that we had for, for fitting. Um, but again, we see that the model pretty nicely matches the training data and then also validation. And just as I mentioned before with the questions, we did um, partition the data differently to try to see uh, if we're biasing the model fit in any way um, to set aside data for training versus for validation. But what we did is to use this calibrated model and apply a sensitivity analysis, which is based on this information theoretic approach. So the approach calculates the entropy, which is characterizing how much information content there is in a particular variable. So the entropy of variable a, uh, y, and then we can calculate also the entropy of variable x. And so the um, information content um, that's conditional between them tells us how much information do we know about y given x, and we can do the reverse as well. Then we also can calculate the mutual information that's given to us by knowing X and Y. And so overall, by doing this um, 
this sort of information theoretic approach, we can calculate the sensitivity index as being the ratio of the shared information compared to the, um, uh, the entropy here of just y. So what this, how we're applying this is to say that the greater amount of information shared between an input, for example, a parameter value and an output, the amount of granzyme B that is secreted tells us that that um, output is more sensitive to the input. So what we did is to vary the model parameters 50% above and below their mean value. We randomly drew 250 samples from that distribution, a uniform distribution, and simulated the model to generate these different distributions for the amount of granzyme B and perforin that's secreted after 60 minutes of stimulation. And then with those probability distributions, we can calculate the sensitivity index. So what we found is that we can identify the influential model parameters. And here I'm just showing the top 15 influential parameters based and ordered by their sensitivity index, um, where each of the parameters individually can explain more than 35% of the information, the, the predicted amount of granzyme B secretion that's promoted by CD16. So I'm gonna focus in really for this part, just on CD16 uh, signaling. And so what we saw is that all these parameters are really in this very small subgraph of the full network. And so it indicates that this small subgraph really does influence the amount of granzyme B that is secreted. And so we can sit, we can know given this causal structure um, that we can infer how perturbing some of the parameters might allow the, the simulated cell to secrete more granzyme B. And so that's exactly what we did. We looked at these four different links in this subnetwork. And then we said, well, what happens if, for example, we increase the um, rate, or sorry, decrease the rate at which this kinase SFK will um, activate the, uh, the phosphatase SHP and so on. And so what we found is that for these four variables of interest, um, the percent increase in the granzyme B secreted would be greatest when we inhibit this reaction. We can actually um, increase the activation by, or decrease the activation by 50% and lead to a doubling of the amount of granzyme B that is secreted. And so just to recall, to remind you, again, that phosphatase activity came up in the first part of the talk um, and it was shown to strongly influence overall network activation. But, decreasing this activation of SHP actually comes at a, cost, at a cost. Yes, we can secrete more granzyme B, but the intracellular pool of granzyme B actually becomes depleted. And so we want to try to counteract this effect. And so although we can inhibit the species deactivation, it actually depletes this intracellular pool. And so what we wanted to do is apply some synthetic biology um, which can allow us to address this issue of being able to promote the production of a protein. And so we essentially simulated a synthetic circuit with the model to couple the um, reduced activation of the phosphatase along with production of um, the protein for uh, granzyme B and uh, perforin as well. So increasing the intracellular pool. Um, so to do this, we simulated this synthetic receptor system called the SYN-NOTCH signaling system. Um, SYN-NOTCH uh, allows the cell to specifically respond to some input stimulus. For example, the binding of uh, the ligand that normally binds to CD16, maybe it can bind to the synthetic receptor. It releases uh, the transcription factor that then could promote the production or transcription of the gene for granzyme B. And so we can simulate this in our model. We make some assumptions that the SYN-NOTCH receptor binds to the uh, ligand with the same affinity as the endogenous receptor. Then we add in these plasmids that allow for not only the um, inhibition of the phosphatase activity via this long non-coding RNA, but also increase the production of intracellular granzyme B and perforin that then can be um, secreted upon activation of CD16, for example. So we had to add onto our endogenous network, this synthetic system. 
where we have the synthetic receptor, it forms a complex with the ligand that leads to activation of this transcription factor, which leads to the production of perforin or granzyme B, and also leads to the inhibition of the phosphatase uh, SHP. So what we had to do is to um, try to optimize the amount of perforin or granzyme B that is secreted when we change the amount of the synthetic notch receptor, um, so that's R0 down here, or also change the amount of the plasmids that encode for the long non-coding RNA that inhibits SHP or encodes for the um, uh, granzyme B or and perforin. So we wanted to optimize the amount of granzyme B and perforin that would be um, secreted while minimizing the effort, right? The, the synthetic components that we would have to provide to the system. So um, I'm gonna show the results for the optimization and maybe I'll, I'll um, sort of show these results in one other before we, we wrap up given the time. Um, so here are the results. What I'm showing is the optimal amount based on uh, applying optimal control theory to minimize the effort while maximizing the performance, the secretion, we can see that um, it really does depend on how many rounds of stimulation the uh, NK cell would be expected to undergo. So what I'm showing is the optimal amount of the synnotch receptor that's in yellow, the plasmid for the um, uh, that would encode for the cytolytic species, granzyme B and perforin, that's in blue, and also the plasmid that would encode for the long non-coding uh, RNA for SHP, which would inhibit SHP activity. And then we did this optimal uh, optimization uh, for different numbers of rounds of stimulation because we would not know a priori how many rounds of stimulation the NK cell would undergo. And so what we find is that there are mainly three um, different regimes here. Uh, so the first regime is for having um, no control. So that's what happens when we have, sorry here, that's what happens when we have just one or two rounds of stimulation. It's better just to allow the endogenous pathway to proceed and not add any of these synthetic uh, components. And that's in comparison to um, a semi, or sorry, a maximum control regime where all three components are at their maximum allowable values um, that we constrain based on experimental evidence. So the maximal amount of the synnotch receptor, the maximal amount of the plasmid for the cytolytic molecules, and also underneath here, you can't see, but it's in orange, the maximal amount of the long non-coding RNA for SHP. And then lastly, there's another regime that is for the semi, that we're calling semi-max control, where synnotch receptor and cytolytic plasmid are at their maximum values, but the LH, the long non-coding RNA for SHP is basically at its lowest value possible. Um, so for longer rounds of, longer number of rounds of stimulation, it's better to not inhibit the activity of the phosphatase SHP. So we just went another step forward, which is to say for each of these regimes, do, can we uh, quantify and predict how much granzyme B is actually uh, produced? And just to make sure that for a given round of stimulation, it does indeed match what the optimal control analysis told us. So just to give you an example, for um, four rounds of stimulation, it's better to have the maximum control that's shown in green. So that's the regime for maximum control compared to semi-max or no control at all. But one thing to note, and I'll probably end here, um, one thing to note is that for many, many rounds of stimulation, we still don't have a lot of granzyme, being, uh, granzyme B being released. And this is not because granzyme B is um, depleted, right? That's the purpose of having this synthetic uh, notch uh, signaling uh, circuit is because we can increase the amount of granzyme B that is inside of the cell that can then be um, secreted by um, activation of the CD16 pathway. But what happens is now we have a different set of limiting factors, which is the PLC gamma and also PVAV, which mediate the release of this intracellular pool of granzyme B. So what we're excited about is that we can use this mechanistic model to um, answer some questions about how to tune or enhance signaling 
by incorporating this synthetic notch uh, receptor pathway. So just for the sake of time, um, I will just skip the last couple of slides and go here, which um, is to say that the optimal strategy for enhancing the secretion of these cytolytic molecules is, is still context dependent. So it depends on, which I didn't show you, how much of the ligand is present. It depends on, um, for example, whether there's any cooperativity in the transcription, um, the rate of transcription for these uh, proteins. And so there are other things that we have dug into to try to understand how optimizing the um, secretion of these cytolytic molecules can be done under different conditions. So just to summarize everything, we've just uh, constructed this mechanistic model of natural killer cell signaling. Um, it allows us to predict the magnitude of the cell activation and also the effects of perturbing the signaling network. And then in the second half, I talked a little bit about how we can um, use this model to predict strategies to enhance signaling and specifically how to apply uh, optimal control theory to do that. So very quickly, um, we're using this to move forward. We're actually trying to work on a more multi-scale approach. So incorporating the molecularly detailed model that I just described to you inside of a cell in order to see how that influences the cell behavior and then how the cells can interact with one another inside of the, the tumor. So really being able to simulate interactions between the tumor and immune cell populations. And then something else that we're really excited about that actually um, we have a grant proposal in right now to look at how we could perhaps use the model to um, identify what a, a good construct would be for chimeric antigen receptors that are based on NK cell endogenous receptor signaling domains. So maybe it's good to combine different signaling domains that are derived from the endogenous uh, NK cell, and we can use preclinical in vitro and also preclinical studies to test the um, predicted optimal CAR constructs. So with that, I will thank the members of my lab that are shown here when we were able to uh, to join one another on campus. Um, I'm really highlighting the work of Sahak Makarian and all that he's done in studying NK cell signaling, as well as our collaborators and funding sources. And then I'll thank all of you for your attention. And um, if we have time and interest, I'm happy to answer more questions. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, so at this moment, obviously you guys have uh, questions. This is a good time. So I have a couple, but I don't want to be the only one that's going to ask, but I'm going to. Okay. So um, really nice, Stacey, lovely work. Um, I love the fact that you're sort of getting to the end, thinking about context, thinking about bridging scales. As you know, I've got an interest in that area particularly. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it sounds like you're already going to consider this, but I want you to sort of articulate it anyway. So, you know, this idea of your sort of synthetic piece could also be potentially an input from the environment that the cell's in, right? And so, you know, we know that Granzyme B is intracellular and extracellular, yep. right? And so the, how would that impact your feedback circuit there? Because mm. it was interesting that within your network, the kind of, you know, the sensitive part is exactly where the, the, the feedback is. Yeah. Um, and so to me, it makes a lot of sense. That's where it would be, right? Um, but if you then have a big feedback loop on the outside, which is that intracellular is being impacted by the extracellular, mm. uh, what does that do to your system? I guess, thinking about that? Um, so, yeah, I'm going to have a, a guest here too. <laughs> We can't wait any longer. Um, so yeah, so that's a good point. We have been focusing in on um, sort of the interactions that are happening inside of the cell. And you're right, there could be other factors that influence the overall cell signaling that are dependent on the environment in which these cells are residing. Not, and that could come from you know just the um, environment that they're in, but also maybe something that is primed and influenced by other cells other neighboring cells. So that's actually what we're excited to start to look into um, and just to see 
uh, what we could uncover here. We might be able to use the model to say, well, let's just test out what are some different ways in which the cells could be interacting and the ways in which they could be influenced by the, um, the extracellular environment. And so I think the model is a nice uh, platform to uh, try to answer some of those questions. Yeah. And so, you know, just a brief elaboration on that. So, you know, my interest was in AKT signaling or kinase signaling and how stroma, stroma nearby potentially mm -hmm. produces growth factors, then that alters how those pathways behave. Yeah. And we're particularly interested because those targeted drugs that are going after specific components of the pathway then may be modified because the pathway is signaling differently in this different mm -hmm. environment. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that we wrestled a bit with when we, when we were building that model was the time scales. So there's a, you know, intracellular signaling has a time scale associated with it, cell decision making and, you know, processes have a time scale associated with them. And then of course the drug itself is going to have some time scale associated with it. How are you wrestling with that problem? Yeah, so I can at least tell you uh, this example from the, um, the modeling of metabolism that we have. So the two papers that I showed there when I brought up the, um, the model of central carbon metabolism, one is using CompuCell3D where we embed that uh, intracellular model into the um, cells. And then we have the basically energy production influence the cell behavior. So like how likely it would be to proliferate or to die um, from starvation, or again, depending on uh, its environment and metabolism of the nutrients. Um, and so in that case, we had to bridge these scales uh, of time by really doing like a hybrid approach, right? So we would simulate the intracellular model um, for a period of time. And that would, uh, the output from that would feed into some um, decision-making um, network uh, that would then influence like the behavior of the cell. So that's how in my mind, we would apply it here too is saying, yes, we know that these things are happening on different scales. And so we'll have to really have something running on um, this intracellular time scale and then have that inform the more longer time scale, such as um, decision making for the cell or really the cell behavior itself. I guess it raises the question about how persistent does the intracellular signal have to be to trigger a cellular decision? Like if it just jumped up briefly, yeah. um, would that be enough? Or is it, it has to reach its steady state somehow and stick there and then drive a decision? I know that's a hard question, but that's the sort of question we were wrestling with and there's no easy answer. Yeah, I'm wondering, so that's, it could, we could try to help understand that or take that into account by looking at the area under the curve. Then we get sort of the, um, the accumulated response, right? Instead of just looking at the maximum value and is that enough to influence cell behavior? That's, uh, that's maybe one way to get at it. But I completely agree. It's like, is, and we talked sort of talked about it before, is that transient increase really going to influence the cell behavior on a longer time scale? Thanks. This, these are all good thoughts to keep track of. Cool. Um, um, well, other questions? Um, Sandy took my last question. I had the same question about time scales. <laughs> Sandy. Great talk. Thanks for uh, Thanks, being Mark. with us. Yeah, this is Mark from Office. It was a great talk. I really enjoyed the approach and some of the results you got. It was really interesting. Um, I did have a question in terms of like, this kind of exhaustion is something that's looking like tre treatments are being developed to try and, you know, um, reduce the uh, exhaustion or delay it or something. Have you, have you tried, for example, targeting specific nodes of the network to see if you can kind of extend the, the active phase of the, of the, of the cells? Right. Uh, so that was part of um, like our question to say, if we inhibit this link here, so the activation of the phosphatase um, by the kinase, is it possible to um, get more um, granzyme B secretion? But maybe you're asking a different question, which is like, 
Um, can we look at the profile of the intracellular signaling species and better characterize what exhaustion looks like and then how to optimize maybe not just the secretion, but actually overall, like more, again, a, a systems level view of what the profile of these signaling species might be. So we have really just looked at like changing an input and seeing how that, uh, changing a parameter input and seeing how that influences the output in terms of um, the secretion, the amount that is secreted, but maybe we could consider um, some combination of the signaling species together that might uh, be a good way to characterize exhaustion. Yeah, so there's there's generally, like uh, I'm not as familiar with NK cells, but like in the T cell biology, there's definitely yeah. a lot of discussion as to what exactly exhaustion so a lot of the markers that are functional beings are not necessarily, you know, they're not necessarily like going to say for certain it's in one state or the other, but they have this kind of, you know, intermediary phases where you express some of the markers and then not others. So, yeah, so like yeah. a profile of sorts. Um, but in some sense, you know, there's interactions with other immune cells too, which would, would complicate this, but also maybe looking at it from a perspective of kind of the state of the cell. Um, again, then you still need the function. So it might just be that enzyme B release is kind of the major output. You know? Yeah, I guess anyway, that's I just, sort of just... something that could be profiled really easily is, is there a reduced amount of granzyme B that's secreted? But you're right, we can use the detail of the model to maybe see, is there some other profile combination of signaling pr proteins to look at? Um, so that's something, yeah, that we can we can definitely take, take another, uh, another look at. I guess the other side of the coin, it, it, you kind of showed it with, even in the best case, it would eventually decay. But is there any cases where if you target something, you would get like basically, um, it can, you know, can, can, uh, kind of irreversible, not irreversible, but like a continuous activation, because that could be like almost problematic as well as if you can't shut it down, then right. you have kind of this opposite problem. Do you ever see anything like that where like if you get it, if you hit certain part of the network or knockout, you see like, you know, constitutively now they're active no matter what? Yeah, I, I don't think we can really answer that question because again, we don't have production of other proteins here. So that is why like that last part I mm -hmm. showed, uh, PLC gamma and PVAV, um, because they're starting non-phosphorylated species are just being de uh, depleted. And so, once we move to this longer time scale, then we have to actually augment the model to include uh, production of these signaling species um, that would then sort of um, release that limitation of like depleting some of the, the intracellular pools that are needed to have secretion of uh, granzyme B or perforin. So yeah, I think right now it's hard to answer the question of whether there would be some cases where we just have almost uncontrolled like secretion and it's uh, uninhibited. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Well, thank you very much again. Cool. Oh, thank you very much, Stacy. Okay. All right. Thanks so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer other questions by email. Or Yes, and Shani <laughs> says bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. <laughs> See you all in December. Bye. 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 Thank you, Shani.